There we go. All right, let us go ahead and begin. Uh, today we are going to do uh, Psalm 46. Uh, so we're going to begin a little differently uh, this time. Uh, this psalm is about deliverance. And of course, it's the psalm that Martin Luther referenced when he wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Uh, so as we remember God's deliverance of his people, uh, we can't forget that his final deliverance that is accomplished is from sin, death, and the power of the devil uh, through Christ's work on the cross for us. So for our opening prayer this evening, we're going to uh, read the words of the Benedictus, which are the words that John the Baptist's father spoke when John the Baptist was born. So we pray. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Amen. Okay, so th through reading through Psalm 46 this evening, uh, we will be able to identify God's power in nature, his power over nature, uh, be able to describe God's protecting hand as evidenced in our lives, and to be able to trust more fully in God's promise to be free of fear and to rejoice in goodness. So Psalm 46, depending on your translation, uh, will have a preface above it, and it will say something to the effect of, for the choir director, a psalm of uh, the sons of Korah set to Alamoth. Uh, Alamoth, we do not know exactly what that is, but we believe it is either a tune or it is a part of the chorus. Uh, uh, one meaning of the Alamoth can be like the high notes, so it would be the soprano part, I guess you would call it, to uh, our music. They think that may be what that means. They're not entirely sure. Uh, and then the sons of Korah are uh, the, the Korahites in the Bible. Uh, they were a branch of singers also. Uh, the sons of Korah were the sons of Moses' nephew, Korah. And the uh, story of Korah is in Numbers chapter 16. We won't look at that uh, tonight. But Numbers chapter 16 uh, describes how uh, Korah rebelled against Moses, and he and all of his uh, conspirators, co-conspirators, were swallowed, or God opened the earth and it swallowed him and all of his uh, people that rebelled with him. Uh, but it says then the, the children of Korah died not, so they were not taken. And there are several psalms written by the sons of Korah, uh, 42, 43 for 49, which counts what we're doing tonight, 84, 85, 87, and 88. Uh, you don't have to know that. Uh, but some of the Korahites were also porters in the temple, so they did uh, kind of the busy errand work. And they were also, uh, in First Chronicles 9, verse 31, says that they were over the things that were made in the pans, which would be the baking pans for meat offerings, so the portion of the meat offering that the people uh, shared together in a communal meal. And then there is also a tradition, uh, but we do not know it for sure, that Samuel was descended from Korah. But we don't, we don't know that. And that's about all we know about the sons of Korah. But before we read the psalm, Psalm 46, we're going to, read, we're going to do it backwards tonight and see if that is helpful. Uh, we are going to look at where this psalm comes from historically. So the story about where Psalm 46 came from, comes from 2 Kings uh, in chapter 18, beginning in verse 13, and all the way through chapter 19. Uh, I may read all of it, I may not, but uh, we'll, we'll at least read the, the background stuff so we know what's, what's going on. But it's the story of uh, Senesharib, and Hezekiah. 
So I'll begin with that. That's uh, 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 13. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. Then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lashish, saying, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. So the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Hezekiah gave him all the silver which was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorposts which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. Then the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lashish to king Hezekiah with a large army to Jerusalem. So they went up and came to Jerusalem, and when they went up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is on the highway of the fuller's field. When they called to the king, Elikam, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Ashap, the recorder, came out to them. Then Rabshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what is this confidence that you have? You say, but they are only empty words. I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom do you rely that you have rebelled against me? Now behold, you rely on the staff of this crushed reed, even on Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who rely on him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away, and has said to Judah and to Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Now, therefore, come, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you two thousand horses, if you are able on your part to set riders on them. How then can you repulse one official of the least of my master's servants and rely on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Have I now come up without the Lord's approval against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah said to Rabshakeh, Speak now to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it, and do not speak with us in Judean in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But Rabshakeh said to them, Has my master sent me only to your master and to you to speak these words? and not to the men who sit on the wall, doomed to eat their own dung and drink their own urine with you? Then Rebshekah stood and cried with a loud voice in Judean, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you from my hand, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me and come out to me, and eat each of his vine and each of his fig tree, and drink each of the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. But do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharaim, of Sef, let's try that again, Sepharvaim, Hena and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their land from my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? But the people were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, Do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Ashaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of Rabshakeh. And when King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and entered the house of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, 
who was over the house with Shebna, the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos. They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of distress, rebuke, and rejection. For children have come to birth, and there is no strength to deliver. Perhaps the Lord your God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God, and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, offer a prayer for the remnant that is left. So the servants of the king of Hezekiah came to Isaiah. Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him, so that he will hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. Then Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, for he had heard that the king had left Lashish. When he heard them say concerning Tirhaka, king of Cush, Behold, he has come out to fight against you. He sent messengers again to Hezekiah, saying, Thus you shall say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you into saying, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, destroying them completely. So will you be spared? Did the gods of those nations which my fathers destroyed deliver them, even Gozan and Haran and Rezeph and the sons of Eden who were in Talasar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvaim, and of Hena and of Iva? Then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the nations of kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And listen to the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have devastated the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, so they have destroyed them. Now, O Lord, our God, I pray, deliver us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard you. This is the word that the Lord has spoken against him. She has despised you and mocked you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She has shaken her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice, and haughtily lifted up your eyes against the Holy One of Israel? Through your messengers you have reproached the Lord, and you have said with my many chariots, I came up to the heights of the mountains, to the remotest parts of Lebanon, and I cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypresses, and I entered its farthest lodging place, its thickest forest. I dug wells and drank foreign waters, and with the sole of my feet I dried up all the rivers of Egypt. Have you not heard? Long ago I did it. From ancient times I planned it. Now I have brought it to pass, that you should turn fortified cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore their inhabitants were short of strength. They were dismayed and put to shame. They were as the vegetation of the field and as the green herb, as grass on the housetops is scorched before it has grown up. But I know you're sitting down and you're going out and you're coming in and you're raging against me. Because of your raging against me, and because of your arrogance, has come to my ears. Therefore, I will put my hook in your nose, and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. Then this shall be the sign for you. You will eat this year what grows of itself, in the second year what springs up from the same, and in the third year sow, reap, plant vineyards, and eat their fruit. Their surviving remnant of the house of Judah will again take root, downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem will go forth a remnant and out of Mount Zion survivors. The zeal of the Lord will perform this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he will not come to this city or shoot an arrow there, 
and he will not come before it with a shield or throw a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, by the same he will return, and he shall not come into the city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then it happened that night that the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. It came about as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrash, his god, that Adram, Melech, and Sherazar killed him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. And as Herodon, his son, became king in his place. Okay, that was, that was kind of long. But you see, you see what they did. The, king Hezekiah, by all rights, should have been wiped out. But he prayed, prayed to the Lord. He took his concerns to Isaiah the prophet, and Isaiah prophesied what was going to happen that Israel would be uh, spared. The remnant of Israel would be spared. So now let's look at Psalm 46. Who would like to read that for us tonight? It's not that long. Whoever would like to just start reading. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear through the earth, give, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble as a swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He, he breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Okay. And then uh, in your Bibles, after each of the three sections, does it have this word Salah? Yes. Okay, so the word Salah we don't actually, it's another one, we don't actually know what that means. Uh, it can mean a couple things. Uh, some say that it means a pause, uh, and some mean that it is a pause in the voices, because these are all songs set to music. Uh, so the one, uh, one thing I looked at uh, describes it in the NSAB note, says it's a, a pause, and then a crescendo or a musical interlude. Uh, and what some say is it's okay, the voices stop, and there is a boom, cymbal crash, oh, real dramatic, and then silence, a pause, and then you begin reading the next section of the psalm. And this psalm we're looking at tonight is divided in three sections, and each section uh, has a different theme. Uh, for example, verses 1 through 3 uh, tells us God is stronger than nature. Verses 4 through 7 tells us that God protects Jerusalem with his power. And then the conclusion shows us God is stronger than all enemies. So in verse 1, it tells us three things about God. Uh, they all tell us a different aspect of God's nature. So what do they tell us about God, and why do you think the psalmist chose those words to describe God? So what are the three ways that the three things that the psalmist describes God as? Refuge and strength. Okay, refuge, strength, and? 
right. The same. Uh, a very present help in trouble, right. So those are the three things. Okay, so a refuge is a shelter from something dangerous, right? You take refuge from a storm or a hurricane, what, what have you, bad weather. Um, so God protected his people from their enemies. He is their refuge. Okay, um, God is our strength. How? So if God is our strength, what does that actually mean, God is our strength? He allows us to do things we couldn't do otherwise. Mm -hmm. Right, and in fact, without him, we can't do anything. So everything that we are able to do, we do because God allows it. God enables us to do it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Very good. Yeah, so God is our strength. He is on our side. You know, for all the faithful, God is on our side. He's got our back. So that leads right into a very present help in trouble, an ever-present help. So... What does that tell us about where God is? Where is God? Everywhere, right. So God is our refuge and our strength, and he is our refuge and strength wherever you are. So you are never without him. So we're never separated from our refuge and strength. We're never separated from our helper. Okay, so now looking back into what we read in the Old Testament today, because... That's what inspired the writing of this psalm. So Israel's victory over the odds that you saw happening there. So to whom did they owe that victory? God, right. They couldn't have done it. They would have been, once again, nearly wiped out. So Israel's victory was 100% dependent on the Lord's strength, the Lord's power, the people of Israel sheltering from their enemies uh, sheltering under the wings of the Lord. Okay, now, wait a minute. I keep losing my place in my notes, I'm sorry. Okay, verses 2 and 3 talk about some natural disasters, hypothetical natural disasters, I guess you could say. Uh, these would be you know, horrible, horrible things if they were to happen. Does it... Read those two verses, verses 2 and 3 again, and see if you can see how that is the opposite, exact opposite of something else we have seen in Scripture. Okay, so you have the mountains slipping into the heart of the sea. Waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake at the swelling of the waters. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, that's really good. I didn't think of that. You're you're exactly right. You know, so that is a, that is a looking back to when God split the Red Sea so the people of Israel could walk to safety through it, and it all came crashing down again on. Pharaoh's army. Yeah, that's really good. And then, of course, that points forward to our baptism, you know, our passing through the water of regeneration in the Word, where we come into uh, God's kingdom by baptism. It also looks like the exact opposite of creation. Right? So it's an unmaking. So they're talking about the world being unmade. You know, God first created light. And then he separated light from darkness. He created. He separated the waters above from the waters below, the heaven and the earth. And then he gathered the waters to let the dry land appear. So that's kind of the opposite in Psalm 46 of the creation. It's the unmaking so of the creation. Last judgment. Yeah, that kind of hints at the last judgment. Sure, but when you see uh, that imagery in the Revelation of everything that God made is going to become undone and then remade once again perfectly. Okay, good. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, Jeremiah 5.22 says, Should you not fear me, declares the Lord? Should you not tremble in my presence? I made the sand a boundary for the sea, an everlasting barrier it cannot cross. The waves may roll, but they cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. Now, also, God said to Job, right? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I commanded the oceans? Here you shall come, but no further. Right? So it, it kind of puts all those images in our head. And especially, it brings in that image of, of the end uh, the end of days. Okay, so that was the first part. Second part now is talking about, okay, God's control over nature. Now God protects Jerusalem with that power, that power that has power over and dominion over creation. That's the kind of protection Jerusalem has. That's the kind of protection we have. So in verses 4 to 7, you know, we see this destructive power now looked instead of the power to destroy, it is the power to sustain. Um, there is a river in whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. He will not be moved. Uh, in those days, and even into um, you know, the Middle Ages, really, uh, when you set siege to a city, one of the things you did was you cut off the city's water supply. Because what would happen when you have no clean water? Everybody dies of thirst, and before they even die of thirst, they die of disease. Uh, they die of plagues. If you have no clean water and you have dead bodies piling up, it just becomes, there is no hygiene whatsoever. Uh, so they could take a city without ever breaching the walls if they were able to cut off the water supply and the city had no internal water supply that was protected. Uh, so that was the first way you went out, uh, went into your went to attack a city. Um, when this psalm was written, this is just a little history, uh, Jerusalem had a protected water supply that helped protect them when the city was under siege. It was a wall city also. But the psalm's not really talking about that. They're, they're talking about of a couple of parallel thoughts in verse 4, and it's not necessarily real physical water like we think of. There is a river whose streams made glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and he will not be moved. Yes, good, real good. Okay, so that is the, the river of the water of life without price. So that is the water that flows through the center of the new Jerusalem. Now that's... Revelation 21, I think. Let's look real quick. Twenty one or is it twenty? Does that also refer to baptism? Certainly. Absolutely. 22, I think. No, 21, uh, verse, chapter, Revelation 21, verse 6. And then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. And then in Revelation 22, uh, verse 1. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, etc., and so forth. So yeah, you have that double image in Revelation of the river of the water of life without price. Uh, you can't buy it. You can only be given it. And absolutely, that same water, that is the water of regeneration and rebirth and baptism, always. Uh, always the water connected to the Word of God. Okay, now, throughout the Bible, we see this theme of water, this, this theme of the sustaining river. Uh, we see in the creation account, we see Eden was at the, at the position where three great rivers came together, 
uh, the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the other one that I, one I can't remember. Pishon, Pishon, that's right. Yeah, so you had these three great rivers come together, so you had this ap more than adequate water supply in Eden. Uh, or is there four? I even four, I might have messed that up. Uh, so you have the rivers watering this garden, and the river flowed out of Eden. Uh, Genesis 2.10 is the reference for that one. To ten. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. Pishon, uh, Gihon, uh, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. So there are four rivers. Uh, the significance of the number four there, I'm not sure. Possibly uh, the four ends of the earth uh, just means it flowed out into the entire creation. But Jesus said, anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again the water from the well, uh, when he was talking to the uh, Canaanite woman. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 4, 13. And then Revelation that we just talked about. So that, that water image is always throughout, throughout Scripture. And it's also an image of God giving his people what they need to survive. Uh, so water, physical water quenches our physical thirst. Spiritual water quenches our spiritual thirst. Christ is the source of that water, the water that leads us to eternal life. And that satisfies the, our deepest needs as fallen human beings. Okay. Any questions or comments so far? Okay. Then, God's people are able to withstand attacks. The attacks of nature, the attacks of other people, uh, because God is our refuge and strength. So what is that image in verse 5, 40, Psalm 46, 5? How does that emphasize that, that truth that we have? Okay, so it's not talking about the water anymore. It's talking about God himself. Uh, her being Jerusalem. True, true. Yep, so you think of, you can think of in the abstract now, you know, a great walled city on a hill. That, that's where you built a city to be protected from your enemies because you could see your enemies coming. And once they got there, they couldn't get through the walls, hopefully. All right, so if God is described as... It doesn't get to that yet. Uh, but God is in the middle of all that, right? He, and it says, he, the, she won't be moved because God is there. So that, that like city... Like a break wall? Kind of like a break wall, yeah. Like a break wall in the, in the yeah, lake. Like standing, you know, so the, in the midst, and then nothing passes them. Right. I mean, that's what I was trying to visualize. Right, so if you have a big break wall in a lake, like Lake Erie, Lake Michigan, they put the break wall up so that the inland, in, uh, the coastal area doesn't get inundated by the high tides. The wall takes the brunt of that, especially during a storm, so that the harbor is protected behind the wall. And if the wall gets breached, then, yeah, that's really bad. Yes. They had the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And that was in the center, correct? The tabernacle was in the center of the camp. And right. So, um, is that what maybe they were referring to in this case, in verse 5? 
That's that's good. That very well could be. You know, when we think of Jerusalem, the holy city, which is where the temple is, and then if they're always, always looking back to the Exodus, always looking back to their history, where they came from, they would, of course, think about the tabernacle in their wanderings. Okay, good. So the tabernacle was in the midst of them, and who was in the tabernacle? God, right? Because God, in the form of the glory cloud, came down and rested on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant between the two uh, folded wings of the seraphim that were on the seraphim? On, on the, were they cherubim? Were they cherubim on the top of the Ark? So there's two angels on top of the Ark, and they had their wings folded like this, so in the middle there was this spot on the lid called the mercy seat. And the mercy seat is where the glory cloud came down and descended behind the veil in the holiest of holies. That is the place where God dwelled, where God tabernacled among his people. So yeah, that could be very much uh, that image that they are thinking of. And that points us forward to the way God tabernacled with us. How did God do that? Where was the new tabernacle? How was that? Where? Well, the other man in our midst. Right. Yep, Jesus is God. But where, would, where did the tabernacling take place? Oh, Nope. A little earlier. Think Christmas. Oh. Okay, so the womb of Mary is the new tabernacle when, when Christ became incarnate, when Jesus became Jesus. So Mary's womb was the new tabernacle. That is where God came to tabernacle with us, and from there he came into the world as a human baby. Uh, not that Mary was special. She was a sinful woman just like every other human being, but she was chosen for this purpose. And for that purpose, she became, her womb became the new tabernacle where Christ came into the world for us as our Savior. Okay, so yeah, that, all that imagery, that tabernacling imagery, that place where God came to dwell. And now God comes to dwell today. Where and how? Where does he come to dwell with us now? In all those things. So yes, he, God is in our, you know, Jesus is in our hearts, but he is also physically with us. He comes to earth in bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper. And he is there in the water, the water, the same water we've been talking about, the water of baptism, he is there. So yeah, that is how co Jesus comes to dwell with us bodily, physically, yet today. Good. Now, how is the Holy Spirit involved in all of this? Is he, he's ever present. He is. Yep, and, and we have, and you have him by nature of baptism. Okay. You know, when you are baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, not sure what, what denomination you guys come out of and what your... Okay, so we'll talk about that. But uh, the, the Lutheran understanding and of the Holy Spirit is this. Uh, we cannot believe in God without having the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we're good. So uh, be, when you are baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gifts you the ability to know that you believe in God and to know that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Uh, you become aware of all that through the power of the Holy Spirit. Without it, yeah, you are lost. So, uh, which is why we baptize babies. Uh, baptism creates faith because the Holy Spirit creates faith. So, uh, we do not believe that you have to uh, believe in Jesus as your Savior before you get baptized or to make a decision. Because we believe in baptism, you are given the gift of belief through the Holy Spirit. So. Yeah, which can be a little strange to some people who uh, well, we're not brought up with that. That that's one of our differences. Um, no, I am not, and that is one of the things that's confusing to Lutherans. That uh, do you need to? Do you have to be baptized to go to heaven? No, you do not. You can believe the Holy Spirit can work when and where He wills. Scripture says we cannot put binders on the Holy Spirit. Oh. The Holy Spirit can only save us by baptism and the Lord's Supper and confession and absolution. No. But God created the sacraments with that physical aspect that we can touch and taste and see because we're 
humans, and that's how we operate in the world is through our senses. So he gives us that physical element as something to grab hold of, uh, to understand his words then, take heed, this is given for you for the forgiveness of sins, and I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what Paul and uh, the evangelist tell, tell us about baptism in the New Testament. So yes, we know baptism now saves you, as scripture says, and believe and be baptized and you will be saved. But it doesn't say, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he who does not believe and is not baptized will be damned. It doesn't say that. It says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, he who does not believe will be damned. So yeah, baptism now saves you, but it is not the only way. And it is not required, you know, gotta make sure that box is ticked off, but why would you want to withhold that from a member of your family when you know baptism now saves you? Uh, but no, you do not have to be. You do not have to go to the Lord's Supper to go to heaven. You know, it's not a law. Uh, it's a gift. Exactly. I was just going to say that. Absolutely. So yeah, we cannot, put, we cannot put restrictions on the Holy Spirit's work. He works when and where he wills. Uh, like Jesus said, you, you, you hear the wind, you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. And that's what he's talking about. Uh, and that also is talking about us as, as missionaries uh, spreading the gospel in the world. You plant the seeds, and actually that's the Sunday's gospel lesson. I'm not preaching on it, but it's the parable of the, of the seeds, the parable of the sower. Not the parable of the four kinds of soil. It's the parable of the sower. And that is the one that is throwing his seed. God is so liberal with his seed, he throws it in the good earth. He throws it on the rocks. He throws it on the path. It'll spring up, and with maybe some extra work or whatever, it'll take root. But, you know, he doesn't go, oh, well, this will never take, so I'm not wasting the seed there. He throws the seed there. He puts it out there. So you can't put restrictions on God's work. Although he gives us a limited list of, okay, you know this works. I'm giving you this so that you know it works. But there's other ways that work that we're not privy to. You know, the Holy Spirit can work faith however he wants to. Uh, which is why we don't say for certain that certain things mean you went to hell either. Uh, that's a little off topic for tonight, but... A lot of people believe someone who commits suicide automatically goes to hell. I do not, and a lot of theologians and a lot of Lutheran pastors will agree with me that there would show me in Scripture where it says that. It does not. You know, are there unfor it says the one unforgivable sin is the sin against the Holy Spirit, which is, God, I don't want anything that you have to offer me. It rejecting all those gifts. That's the unforgivable sin. Which means that are all the other sins forgivable? So, yeah, someone can be so torn inside and just so brutalized mentally and physically that they take their own life almost compelled to do it, almost from outside their own psyche to do that. That, that are all people that commit suicide in hell? I, don't, I, I do not think so, and I don't think the Bible tells us that. But that's another topic for another time and and boy there is no agreement on that so if you go steve said that people that commit suicide don't go to hell that's my interpretation of scripture and i don't see anywhere that contradicts that but other pastors lutheran and otherwise will say oh yeah people that commit suicide go to hell that that has been debated since day one and it is still debated so I believe that is true. I don't know how anecdotal that is, but I, that sounds like Luther to me. Uh, and they even depicted that uh, in one of the movies. Yep. The one with uh, Ralph Fiennes' brother plays Luther. I can't remember his name. The other Fiennes' brother, but yeah. Right, and see, that is some of the holdover baggage we have from Roman Catholicism, because you have the, the um, mortal sins, and mortal sins, if you don't confess those, you go to hell right now. Suicide is one of them. Uh, and any unconfessed sins at the time of your death had to be worked off. 
So they have the so-called venial sins, which is you know all the not so bad stuff. They have you know grades of sins, and somehow they came up with how many years of purgatory you got in for that, and then so many things you had to do to work that off, uh, which is why they sold indulgences and all this stuff that they just made up because this stuff is not in the Bible anywhere, anywhere, and that's one of the things Luther uh, reformed with the church. Uh, but they got this idea in your head that these sins that you did not uh, you did not confess and receive absolution for after you made satisfaction. So you, after you did the Hail Marys and the Our Fathers and good works and all that to pay off the debt of that sin, then you could go to heaven. And if you had all that stuff on your account when you died, you had to go to a special place where all that got worked off before you could enter heaven. And then they said, what happens to all the unbaptized babies? Because original sin, you know, original sin, born with original sin, so they're sinful, but they never got a chance to repent. So they go to a place called limbo, which is where the unbaptized babies go, and they're just there because there's nothing, they can't do anything to get out of it, which seems super fair, right? And then recently, it's my understanding, in the last uh, few years or so, the Roman Catholic Church has done away with limbo. <laughs> it's no longer a thing, so what does that tell you? Uh, they said, yeah, this is, this is not a good thing and now there's no more limbo okay so that means all the unbaptized babies got to go it's silly mm -hmm. it's silly it's stuff of men making stuff up and it's the same way with these these unconfessed sins uh, being you know suicide being one of them because that was deliberate uh, that's a test of God you know here you go God you know, I'll show you but I I, there is no biblical basis that anyone can show me to prove to me that that is a fact. It may be, but I don't think so. I don't think you can prove that to me from the Bible. And there's a whole lot of other people who back me up on that. I'm not just making it up. Someone had a question. Do you have a question? Oh, yes, they do. And that's where it gets even more complicated. I mean, the, the, before the Roman Catholic Church was the Roman Catholic Church, and they were just called the Universal Church because they were the only Christian church. You know, before, you know, they believe that, that Christ died for them, but we have to do our part. We cooperate with Jesus in our salvation. That's the part that got added on somehow at some point from... Jesus, the apostles, their disciples, the early church fathers that we have all their writings too that you can read. And somewhere after that, third, fourth, fifth century, things went sideways. And all of a sudden, you have this cult of Mary, praying to Mary. And Mary can forgive sins. And Mary can hear your prayers and take your prayers to Jesus. And then you had this working off your sins because, yes, Jesus died for you, but you have to do your part to show you mean it. So... When you do something bad and confess it, you don't get that word of absolution until you do your satisfaction, which is all the works. And then that's where monks came from and nuns. Monks cut themselves off from the world, devoted themselves to prayer, to pray to the saints, to pray to God, to do all these works within their walls because the world out there is evil and sinful. So they stay inside here where it's safe. And they got up and did their praying seven times a day and singing the psalm, the entire 150 psalms a week between all these seven prayer services they did, which there's nothing wrong with that stuff. But again, that was all stuff they were doing for God. And that's where Luther, as a monk, was so distraught and why his life was shortened from the things he did to himself, sleeping on the cold floor because he didn't think he deserved to sleep in a bed. Uh, you know, whipping himself with the knotted cords to, uh, to scourge his body in repentance for his sins. He'd go to confession and confess all his sins, and the Lorman Catholics believe, believed, I don't know if you have to do that today, but they believed you had to confess every sin. You had to list every one. Who, if, if you made a record of sins, O oh Lord, who could stand, Scripture says. So, but they had to remember every single one. So Luther would confess and get out of the confessional and get right back in line and do it again because he thought of something. So he was just driving, he was making himself neurotic. He made, drove himself crazy and physically sick. And he was physically sick 
the whole rest of his life. You know, he had like, a, I want to say he had what we call irritable bowel syndrome today. His stomach was always upset. He was a terrible sleeper. And he was just sick all the time, sickly. Uh, and he still did all that work, which is also amazing. But yeah, he made his life shorter from all that punishment he did to himself because they saw God as an angry judge. And it was all about the judgment and working off the penalty and nothing about grace. You know, it's like, yeah, Jesus died for your sins, but you have to do your part. And, and that's what we call, what is the fancy term for that? We're monergists. We believe that we are saved only through God's work. And then there's uh, synergists, which are those who believe Jesus died for your sins, but we have to help with our salvation by doing our part, which sounds reasonable. Oh, wait, well, yeah, i got to do my part. No. As, as Luther showed from Scripture, we can't do anything. All of that is just worthless noise. And he, in his writings, probably because he was a monk and took it very seriously, that he wrote all this scathing stuff about the Pope and about monkery and this buffoonery and monkishness. And it's kind of funny to read, but then you realize what he did to himself being a monk and why he was so angry about that, probably. Because you saw it was all stupid. It was, it was silliness. You know, is, is praying seven times a day fantastic? Yeah. But that's not getting you to heaven any quicker. It, God doesn't count that to you. It's, oh, yeah, you prayed today. Good, 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 good. No, no. When we get to heaven and the creed says, you will be called to account for the things that you've done that are good and the things that are done that are bad. And that's at the end of the Athanasian Creed we read on Trinity Sunday and everybody gets to that and goes, Huh? What's this? That's not Lutheran. Well, yeah, we will be called to account for all the things that we did wrong. And God's going to look at you and go, not guilty, because Jesus paid for it. And he's going to look at all the good things you did, and he's going to say, the Holy Spirit did those. You didn't. And we acknowledge that. Because that's what the Bible says. Everything good I do is the Spirit through me. I didn't do it. I'm just, I'm just the, the, the meat puppet that did the stuff through the power of the Holy Spirit. Anything good I do. And all the bad stuff I do, yeah, that, that's 100% me. But Jesus died for that. So. I still don't agree with them. Um, that, uh, that they still accept the Holy Spirit. But they are supposed to be doing certain parts. They do everything they do their part. So I, you know, whatever they all have to do. Mm hmm Um, what, who are we talking about now? Um, well, yeah, I can say Catholics that mm -hmm. really have to go through all this, you know, for, sure. for penance. Um, but then they don't really believe that the Holy Spirit does everything for them. No, they don't. Like I said, they believe in a cooperation. Yes. Well, they don't deny the Holy Spirit. You know, they just... Do they truly believe it correctly? No. No. Now, does that mean all the Roman Catholics are going to hell? No, it does not. They still believe that Jesus is their Lord and Savior and that he died for them sin their sins. They just have this mistaken notion that they're cooperating with it. Which, is that keeping them from heaven? No, because Jesus still died 100% for their sins. They're forgiven. But they're doing all this extra stuff they don't have to do, is the point, really. So, or at least tying themselves up in knots. And they're tying themselves up in knots. The real, if you're a really devout Roman Catholic, you are driving yourself crazy mm -hmm. with, with the penance and the keeping track of sins and, and whatnot, that you don't have to. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're going to hell. Uh, just like our most, I mean, it'd be, it would be real difficult to say that only Lutherans are going to be in heaven. No, they're not. There's going to be all kinds of Christians in heaven from all kinds of different denominations across all kinds of centuries. Uh, one of us has to have it right. I happen to believe the Lutherans have it 100% right. Of course I do. But, but that doesn't mean that just because we do not have the 100% agreement in doctrine that I think you're all going to hell. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. The ones that I think are mistaken are the ones that call themselves Christian and are absolutely not Christians. That would be Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, 
uh, Jews, Muslims. They say they all. Everybody says we believe the same God, but we do not. We do not. Uh, so and and. Islam, if you study Islam, is 100% works righteousness. It's all on you to get to heaven, what you do. And then, yeah, it's 100% of that. I mean, Allah is loving and gracious, but if you want to get to heaven, he gave you a list of things you've got to do, and you've got to do them, which is tough. None of those things involve killing people, by the way, in Islam. So. It's, it's one small group of, of Islam that's giving all the rest of them a bad name, although it's a tough, it's a tough religion, but no. Uh, just like there is like one of two small groups of Christians that make the rest of us look like bigots, like Westboro Baptist Church. Okay, those morons. How they call themselves Christians, I have no idea. But they, they misinterpret stuff from the Old Testament as if it applies to Christians and go, here, see, God hates fags. No, he doesn't. Nowhere does it say that. It does say in the Old Testament, if a man lives with another man is with a woman, he will take him outside the city gates and stone him to death with stones. Yes, that's ceremonial law for the Jews because God marked them as the line from which the Messiah will come. They have to look different from the rest of the world. Circumcision dietary laws, what kind of thread your clothes can be made out of in touching, okay? What meats you can eat, how you do this, how you do that, this, that, and the other thing. There's all these rules. And once Jesus came, that all goes away, which is why we can eat pork, we can have shellfish, uh, we can wear whatever we want to wear. We do not have to have our boys circumcised. Uh, and also, we do not have to take homosexuals outside and kill them. Although homosexuality is still a sin, it's the, sixth, it's the Sixth Commandment, you should not commit adultery. I don't care if you're two boys or a boy and a girl. Adultery is adultery, sex outside of marriage. It's a sin, but it doesn't mean I have to kill you. That was for the Jews, long ago. It does not apply to us. Uh, but that's the difference between the ceremonial law and the moral law, where they intersect, where it's still applied by the Ten Commandments, it's still a sin, but the punishment does not have to happen anymore. But they act like, oh yeah, see, God wants you to do that. So, no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. That's why Peter had that dream when he was going to go to the house of some Gentiles, and he had the dream of the blanket coming down, and it had all kinds of weird stuff to eat on it. And it said, you know, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter said, but Lord, nothing unclean has ever touched my lips. And, and then God read him the riot act. Hey, I have declared all these things now to be clean. Do not call unclean what I have declared clean. Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And then he went to the Gentile's house, and he got to eat whatever he wanted to and thought it was fantastic. So, And he preached the gospel to those Gentiles. So I got a little off track there, but yeah, that is, in a nutshell, um, what was our point? How did we get on that topic? The tabernacle. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that, is where, that is where God comes to dwell with us. We, yeah, we talk about sacraments, the physical. Because we're people, we like something we can see. It's quite, what would you rather do, watch a video or listen to the radio? We're visual. We like to see pictures and things sometimes instead of just listening. We use more of our senses together. helps us remember. So you have, okay, we stand up, we eat bread, we drink wine, we receive the body and blood of Christ. But... Uh, we can understand it, maybe not understand it's not the right word, because we do consider it a mystery. But uh, when you have something tangible that you can put your hands on, you can cling to that as truth a little easier than just someone saying, oh yeah, now you've got to go you know, say a few of these uh, by next Friday, and then your sins will be forgiven. Oh, okay. And then roar through them as fast as you can. You can't understand it, but you said them, right? It was like, do, did you have to give people sentences? Did you give people sentences for punishment as a teacher? No. No? You have to write 500 sentences for oh, wait. No. I wish I would have had you. Oh, if you had to write sentences for punishment, like, okay, I was talking in class, not... Can you imagine me doing that, right? So, yeah, I got in trouble a lot. So it was, you know, the first time I was write, write 100 sentences, and then, hmm, okay, that doesn't really take long. 
you know, so it was like 200 sentences, and then the third offense was like 500 sentences. But then you learned all the tricks, hand down from motor mouths of ages past. It's like, well, you know, if you take two or three pencils and you tape them together with a spacer just right, you can hold it, and you can write like three sentences at a time. <laughs> Or you would just go like, I will not talk in class, and you would just go, I, 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 will, 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 not, 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 and you do that, because that's even faster, and then the teacher goes, yeah, you, you typed pencils together to do that. I was like, would you think I was born yesterday? And then they make you do it in front of them, which 500 sentences means after school every day for like a week. Huh? Lutheran school. Yeah, Illinois, Brookfield, Illinois. St. Paul's Lutheran School, Brookfield, Illinois. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> tell me about it. And as you got older, and of course, you learned how to do the sentences quickly without cheating with the glued together stuff. Uh, then it was, you had to write a thousand word paper. Write a thousand, well, it starts off 250 words, 500 words. Thousand words on why you won't talk in class and why that's bad for everybody else. It was in Chicago, was it? Mm hmm yeah, Brookfield, Illinois, that's, yeah, it's a suburb of Chicago. Explains a lot, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they knew. What? Yeah, it probably explains a lot, right? Yeah. Okay, we've completely derailed, so I'll share this with you. So one of my other punishments, the organist of the church was a man, and he was also the principal of the school. So lo and behold, one or two other times when I got in trouble, as you got older, they would, uh, you had to go sit in his classroom after school for detention. And what he did for detention, you weren't allowed to do anything but stare straight ahead. No reading, no homework. It was look straight ahead and don't make a peep. So you had to sit there like this. And he would play classical music as loud as he could. <laughs> well, of course, he's an organist, so he's playing a lot of Bach. And I, to this day, now love Bach because of hearing it so much. It's like, you know what? This ain't bad. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I don't want, I get to listen to Bach, so I'll just sit there, okay? Yeah, so that, that if... indoctrination. No, there was indoctrination, yeah. Yep, yep. Then he got figured that out, and so it was, okay, if you have detention and nobody else, I had to go help him with the organs. So it was like, okay, you I learned how to tune the organ. Huh? Huh? <laughs> uh, at, that, at that, yes. Very much. It, it's like a dog that how many times do you punch it in the head with a newspaper and it just goes and does it again? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I was a little slow. So for that detention, it was go up with him uh, to the pipe organ and learn how to tune it, which is he holds the key down and you go up in the pipes and go deaf and, and bend the little thing. And it'll tell you, okay, stop. And then... Okay, go to the next one over, and, then, uh, and you're like completely deaf when you leave. Mm -hmm. But that was kind of educational, too. But it, it makes for a good story now, but yeah, I got in trouble for talking a lot. They eventually beat it out of me, and I became very introverted. <laughs> so I became like the quietest kid. But, no, they, did, they didn't beat us, but they threatened us with it a couple times. But yeah, yeah, that was very old school. We're not leaving Psalm 46, are we? No. No, we've got a third of the we've got a third of the psalm to go. Yeah, and, and because the last chunk, um, I'll state my question and probably it'll get covered next time. But okay. first time, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's quoting God, or you know, it, it's yes, it's, it's God's talking all of a sudden, and that happens in other psalms too. Yes, it does. And so that's my question is this the holy spirit in the sons of korah or are they remembering him talking to them and that's yeah um yeah we will talk about that next week because that is a good question because god does speak a lot in psalms and then uh also, translations are interesting. So uh, I believe in ESV, it says, be still and know that I am God. Is that what the ESV mm -hmm. says? Yeah. Then I like the NASB. It's an equally literal translation. I just prefer it uh, to the ESV because it's easier to read out loud without tripping over your tongue. Uh, ESV is very clear. It's really difficult to read out loud. It just doesn't flow off the mouth very well, uh, which you can hear when we read some of the longer lectionary selections on Sunday morning, no matter how many times somebody practices it, you'll still stumble over 
because in English, what you think is the next word is not the way they have it. It's just a little different, and it, it's hard to read. But the NASB says, cease striving and know that I am God. And then it has a, a, a little parenthetical note, or, or relax, let go and relax and know that I am God. Now, that's a very interesting translation. We could talk about that. Relax. You're, Frankie says relax. You remember that? Frankie goes to high. Look at it, Beth. Frankie goes to high. You remember that? Okay. There's only like if you're. I have all these pop culture references that you're just going to look at me going, "What are you talking about?" There was this song on the radio in the '80s uh, called "Relax." It was the great song when we were in the seventh grade or something like that. Yeah. One hit wonder. Yes, yeah, so we will continue. We will continue this good discussion tonight. Uh, good insights, and we will continue this one um, next week. Uh, any other questions, comments? I'll try to keep us more on topic. Sorry about that. That was me so going south. Yeah, I think so. I think so. All right. Well, uh, let's join together then in uh, the Lord's prayer. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, thank you everyone.